Roger, Roger, 5905. A correction, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. So we always ask if there's any questions over past material or anything that you read this week. We kind of already covered that while we were getting ready. And uh, so we want to greet those that might be seeing us online. And if you are seeing us online, uh, please send Gary Wise or myself an email and let us know that you're there. You're uh, free to join the class or ask questions at any time. So tonight we're on digital modes. Chapter 6, this didn't used to be its own chapter, uh, but digital has become so popular that now an entire chapter in our license manual is dedicated to it. So 6.1 starts with the basics. That's where we'll jump in. So this is all just background and context. Uh, I think we mentioned before that digital modes are regulated as voice emissions by the FCC. And for that reason, the width of a single sideband channel is going to keep coming up over and over again. And I uh, put this picture up here. We've got a, a Boy Scout or a Cub Scout talking on his microphone. And here's a picture of an AM signal. We've got the carrier in the middle, the lower sideband, the upper sideband. And digital modes, all the digital modes we'll be talking about will be fitting into just the space of one of these sidebands. Because the sideband, single sideband, is about 3 kilohertz or 2.8 or whatever number you want to use, and some of the digital modes are only like 50 hertz wide, you can get lots and lots of those di digital signals in this case of one single sideband channel, which makes digital very, very efficient. So what's happening then, we're going to encode uh, our digital data into tones, and a tone can be transmitted um, in single sideband. So somehow we've got to get ones and zeros from our digital source, usually a computer, into our transmitter as tones. And it goes out as single sideband voice. That's, that's why the digital modes are regulated as voice modes. So we've got several that are listed here. Some of the different digital modes, we'll be getting into those in much more detail. And then you've probably heard of uh, D-Star, System Fusion, some of these other things. Those are different flavors of digital, but they all work the same way. They have to get their um, data into tones and then they, they're transmitted out in the air. Slow stand TV, and I don't remember if we're going to get in, we won't get that into that tonight, but we'll definitely do it when we get to the extra class. But slow stand TV, like images that are sent from the uh, space shuttle, um, come down the same way. Uh, they, they take the video convert all of the aspects of video into tones and then send it down on a single sideband channel. So lots and lots of stuff comes over single sideband. So how, do, how are we going to get the digital ones and zeros converted into tones? That, that'll be a key point that we're going to get to two slides from now. A little bit more overview first. Maximum data rates and bandwidths are specified by FCC rules. So any, any digital um, communications that we want to use have to be within the realm of the rules. We have a lot of flexibility there. And of course, digital codes other than those specified by the FCC must be public. It's the no secret codes thing that, that we learned a lot in the technician class. So you can't obscure communications by scrambling it. So any of the digital modes that we use have to be public enough so that they could be decoded by third parties. All right, a, a term that you'll hear over and over and over again uh, is sound card. And we're going to talk about that for a few minutes because I know when I first got into this, it was a little bit confusing to me. What in the world is a sound card? Why is it so important to amateur digital modes? And uh, how, how are they applied? So we'll talk about that a little bit. Here's a picture of a uh, uh, something out of an older computer. They really don't put sound cards in computers anymore. They're chipsets on, on the motherboard. So frequently used. The data is ones and zeros, and audio is analog. So tones are analog, data ones and zeros. 
since digital modes must operate with audio tones to modulate a, a transmitter, we have to somehow get the digital converted to analog in one direction and the analog converted to digital going in the other direction. So the computer can understand and the humanoid can understand, <laughs> ultimately. Because if, if you're talking to your friend, uh, keyboard to keyboard, you're going to want to be able to interpret what that person is, is saying. So if you think a minute, uh, if you're playing an audio CD on a computer, an audio CD is uh, the silver disc that you put in the CD drive. And uh, if you were to look at it under a microscope, it would be full of little pits. And the pits and the shiny part uh, correspond to ones and zeros as, as the disc spins. In order to get that to your headphones on the computer, those, that digital information has to be converted to analog. So we've got something going on in the computer already that's doing that conversion. Or if you use your computer to store uh, messages or notes, you can hook up a microphone to your computer and then if you've got an application that lets you store um, verbal messages, um, that operates just the opposite way. Your voice is analog. That has to be converted to digital so that it can be stored on the computer's hard drive. So that electronics already exists in your computer. And there's something very magical that happens um, with the amateur digital sound modes. The sound card that does the A to D for CDs or for a microphone is exactly the electronics that we need to operate our digital modes. However, we don't want the audio going, the ones and zeros to go to the speaker. We, we need it to go to the radio. So because of that, um, there's audio driver software that basically repurposes the sound card in your computer or the sound card wherever it happens to be. What can you consider that in a, in a minute? It's going to repurpose the um, sound card electronics to go to a radio and back from the radio. Therefore, normally when you set up a digital mode, you've got to install um, drivers for your, for your sound card, wherever that happens to be, in order for it to work with the radio. So you're telling it, I don't want you to play CDs and record from a microphone. I want you to transmit, uh, I want you to send the audio to the radio and decode the, the audio from the radio. That's it. happens in drivers. Now, where might the sound card be located? Well, I showed you one a plug in card from an older computer. So the sound card can be inside the computer, an actual physical board, or it can be a chipset if it's on the computer motherboard. It can be an external interface. These are a little hard to see. This is a, a signal link, and this is a, a grid blaster. They're boxes that go between your transceiver and your computer to do the conversion um, and, and get it into the correct format. So here, here's a couple of brands that are out there. Some people like, even if they've got a sound card uh, elsewhere in their system, either on the computer or in the radio, some people like having an external interface because the knobs and the buttons on these interfaces are sometimes preferable to the settings and software that you have to make to do the same thing. So there's three ways. We, uh, the sound card can be inside the computer, it can be an external digital device interface, or the sound card can be inside the radio. Here's our favorite ICOM 7300 again. And um, the 7300 and many other modern radios have got the sound card built into the radio. And when that's the case, the only thing you have to do to make your connection from the computer is hook up a USB cable between the computer and the radio. You don't need an external interface. So if that's sound cards, uh, it's where they're located. You know what the function is now, analog to digital, digital to analog conversion. So you might be wondering, where do I find digital activity on handbands? And this chart um, shows you some of the places to look. On one, the 160 meter band, 1.8 to 1.810, is a good place to look. Generally, and that's the exception to this uh, statement up here, where to find digital signals, generally in the higher part of the CW slash data segments. So that'll come up in a full question. And there's also kind of a magic trick, because uh, it'll ask you what frequency will you look for digital? And if you can remember uh, a, a magic number, 70, 70, 
you'll be able to answer those questions when they come up without having to memorize all of the locations. If you had to memorize all of this stuff, you'd go absolutely nuts. But there's only, that's, that's assuming you're not nuts already. <clears throat> so uh, there will be a cool question that asks where you find digital on the 80 meter band. And 3570, there's your magic 70. And on the 20 meter, 14070. So that'll, that'll, that'll help you answer those questions without having to memorize all of this stuff. Just remember the, the seven O's, and you'll have it. Generally speaking, digital signals are in the upper part of the CW or data segments of the band. Now we'll talk for a minute. Uh, in some of this, we're going to hit a couple of different directions here. So there'll be a little bit of redundancy, but it all comes together in terms of answering all of the pool questions. So frequency shift key. Now the concept here is that you've got a tone uh, and then you've got a tone at a higher frequency. You've got two tones that you have available to you. And in order to signal a change in state from a one to a zero or the existence of a one or a zero, we just uh, shift between those two tones. So FSK, and this is also called direct FSK, the, the kind that operates this way, generated by changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. So there'd be a, a pin on the back of your radio on one of the connectors, and you're going to be sending highs and lows, or ones and zeros. And what the radio is going to do is take those ones and zeros and apply them to shift the tone from one value to another value. So that's called direct frequency shift key, when you're moving the oscillator with, with the uh, with on-off signals that are coming in. Now the two separate frequencies of a frequency shift key signal are called mark and space. Uh, anybody know why they're called mark and space? But this, this is really interesting. If, if you go all the way back to Morse code, back in the 1800s, when Samuel Morse first invented the concept of Morse code, there was a paper tape in, in an arrangement where when you would press down the telegraph key, the pen would come down on a on paper, and the, the paper was moving. It was like a paper roll. So um, when you press down for a, a dot or a dash, um, you'd get a mark, mark, you just said mark, <laughs> on the paper. And when you lift the key, you'd have a space. So that's where the original concept of mark and space came from. And that kind of stuff. Um, telegraph operators found that changing paper rolls and, and pens was too much bother, and they learned it to decode Morse code just by the clicks that they were hearing. So that, that concept didn't last very long, but that, that's where the terms mark and space came from. So mark represents one, and a space represents zero. And I've got a couple of diagrams here. This one shows um, some signals in what we'll call the uh, time domain. So here's ones and zeros, they look like, like squares. And here's frequency. You'll see when, we, when we've got a 1, these uh, sine waves are very close together. When we've got a 0, they're further apart, representing two different frequencies. So as we go key up, key down, or mark versus space, we can see that those mark and space signals, digital 1s and zeros, are changing the frequency that, that's being transmitted. And of course, here's, here you, you can, in this case, they're all the same. Down here, you see the effect of the modulation. It's greatly exaggerated. It's, this frequency looks like it's about half what this one is, and it's not, not that far apart. This is called a frequency domain, if you're looking at in a, uh, on a spectrum analyzer display. And you can see these little, these two little spikes. They're actually about 170 hertz apart. That's the uh, standard tone spacing that, that we use for RTTY and various other kinds of uh, signaling. So here we've got a couple of signals, and uh, each one has a spike. And the reason that we see the two is because the data is switching back and forth between those frequencies, and it shows up over here. So that's the concept of frequency shift keying. There's also phase shift keying, which we're going to get into a little bit later. And we're all ready for some practice questions. We're going to see if you remember the magic trick that I, that I told you about. Okay, because we see our 070 there. 
So if, if you wouldn't know that trick, you would have had to memorize all, all of that, that table in order to answer this question. So you're welcome. Thank you. It wasn't my idea, actually. I, I learned from lots of people. Okay, here's a similar one. 80 meter band. What frequency would we would be using there? And that's 8. That's our 70 frame. In what segment of the 20 meter band are most PSK 31 operations commonly found? The wording, there, there's more words here than, than you need to know. Um, but yeah, I heard D there. It's data, it's 20 meters, and there are 070. Uh, comes through for us again. It happens to be below the RTTY segment, uh, which is at the upper end of the, the CW, CW, or 20 meter CW area. Good. So that was, see how easy that is? We try to make them all that way. How is a frequency shift keying signal generated? We're going to be changing directly the hearing B. At least I saw somebody uh, lip reading or speaking B. <laughs> the uh, frequency shift keying signal is generated by changing the oscillator's frequency directly with the digital control signal. So we're coming into the radio with ones and zeros, and the radio is saying, okay, I've got to send this tone or I've got to send that tone based on if it's a one or a zero. That's FSK. That's You're talking about shifting the actual carrier frequency, right? Well, um, Yes, but on the receive side, that just sounds like an audio tone because you're only shifting the carrier frequency by 170 hertz. Yeah. So even though you're shifting the carrier on the received end, it just sounds like you're changing the audio tone. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How are the two separate frequencies of an FSK signal identified? Right, mark and space. Now, hopefully, I, I didn't confuse anybody when I talked about the CW history behind that. But mark and space are what we would call those uh, two signals. Good. Great. Now we'll get into some. There's character-based modes and packet-based modes, and that's what we're going to jump into next. Some of you may have seen a box like this. This is in a, uh, a very old teletype machine that the new services used to always use. Uh, sometimes you'd see them on, on TV, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. Every time the news would come on, you'd hear the clattering teletypes uh, going that that was these these machines. They're, they're pretty clack, clack, uh, they, they cook and clack and make a lot of noise. And they used the current uh, pulses going down a, a phone line, basically, to uh, send the codes that they needed, mechanical teleprinters, uh, but today they've all migrated to computer sound cards. So RTT is, RTTY, or RIDI as it's called, is very much in use on the HF amateur bands. There's a RIDI contest that are very, very popular. Uh, sometimes you don't hear much RIDI outside of contests, but uh, it's a valid mode. It is uh, still used and loved, even though it goes back to the uh, first part of the last century. PSK31 is a, a weak signal mode using low transmitter power and very narrow bandwidth. We'll see more on PSK31 coming up. But there's a bunch of cool questions around that, so I wanted to introduce it early. So here's some definitions. This is context and background for the most part. So a bit is a fundamental unit of data, a zero or a one. Does anybody know what bit stands for? It's a binary digit. Binary digit is a bit. And a binary digit is always going to be a one or a zero. The bit rate is how many bits are going to flow uh, in a given period of time, like bits per second, for example, is a standard measure. So between one computing system to the other, there might be a certain number of bits per second flowing between them. Uh, you might remember the old original 300 baud modems that everybody thought was so cool that you could hook up and do email over, and then 1200, and then maybe some, finally they got up to 56k. But uh, that's what we're talking about there, the number of bits per second that were flowing over the channel right between the computing devices. Now, a symbol in bits and symbols in baud 
is an area that is uh, very easy to confuse. And we'll uh, come, at it, come at this a couple different ways, and hopefully it'll make sense when we're done. So a symbol is a characteristic of a transmitted signal that represents data. The, simple, the simplest form of that might be CW again, where you've got the key pressed down, um, the transmitter turns on. And you lift it up, it goes off. So the symbols are just carrier on, carrier off. In that case, you get one character or one code element per symbol. Now, baud or bauds is the number of symbols per second sent. Symbols sent per second. So the symbol rate. Now, we talked about the bit rate between the two ends, and then the symbol rate is what's happening over the air. And uh, it might seem at this point that they ought to be the same. But that's really not the case, because one symbol, and Dave Kessler, in his long video that he uh, had out there, um, used uh, an analogy of circles and squares and, and triangles. So if, if you could hold up a triangle, that might mean 0, 1, and the square might be 1, 0. So you can actually represent more bits in a symbol than, than the symbol by itself would be. And I'll, I'll show you another analogy coming up here that I really like. So here's... Uh, somebody holding up fingers. So if, if I did this, you'd probably interpret that as being a 1, right? And if I did this, you'd probably interpret that as being a 2. But I, I could make it mean anything that I want. Uh, if we're in a room, and the room is noisy, and um, I, I want to say, please bring me a, a Coke, I, I, I could do this. That means, please bring me a Coke, not just 1 or 0. Or I could hold up 3, and that means I want a Coke and a cheeseburger. So I, I, can, I can communicate quite a, I can communicate many different things by using different meanings attached to the symbols. So if I hold up one hand, I get one signal in the event. That's the symbol. But because I have five fingers, I can actually convey five different flavors of information with, with that, that one hand raise. This means something different than this, for example. So with the closed hand, we can actually uh, represent uh, data from 0 through 5. Now, in electronic applications, uh, the equivalent of lifting up a different number of fingers for each time we raise our hand, that can be done with uh, phase shifts. And we'll, we'll go into that, phase shift key. Tone sent. We already talked a little bit about frequency shift key. We talk about discrete levels or, or amplitudes or combinations of all of these. So these are all ways that we can, over a radio channel, uh, indicate different events, different symbols happening from one end to the other. And the thing that's important for radio is that the, the more symbols that you send per second from a transmitter to a receiver, the more bandwidth is required uh, for that, that signal path. If there's a full question like that. Relationship between transmitted symbol rate and bandwidth, higher symbol rates require greater bandwidth. And uh, here, here's a, a challenge question or a, a, a reach goal, if you want to call it that. If you've got five different states, um, how many possible might that translate to? Remember, we were talking how many um, states can you have with three bits or five bits? So uh, 2 to the fifth power is actually the number of different states that you can signal with, with just five fingers. Here's another chart that might, might help cement some of this. We've got baud, which is symbols, or symbols per second. And how many different states can we have? Well, if, if each symbol represented just one state, we would only be transmitting 300 bits per second. But if we were assigning uh, more states to that, four, we could represent 600 bits per second. And on and on it goes, which is how the very early modems work. They started off with 300 baud and eventually got up to 56k baud, uh, all by sending, uh, creating a different number of states for each transition, or holding up a different number of fingers for each time something changed. Um, so that, that's another way to look at it. So you can see that the baud rate in symbols per second does not have to be the same as bits per second. You get a lot more data through with a much slower symbol rate, which is a good thing. 
few more definitions. This is uh, again, again context and background. Duty cycle. That's how how long your transmitter is turned on. Uh, so if, if you have a CW, or if you're turning it on for one second, off for one second, on for one second, off for one second, there would be a duty cycle of 50 percent. So the different digital modes have different kinds of duty cycles. And that can be important, uh, and we'll see why in a little bit. Because some transmitters are not designed, transceivers aren't designed for continuous power output. A protocol, rules that control the method used to exchange data. Well, how do I interpret a one or a zero? If I'm going to shift a tone, does that happen in a certain time slot? So all, all of those are rules about interpreting what's going on uh, are a protocol. Then a mode is a combination of a protocol with a modulation method. So RTTY or PSK31 might be doing shifting of, of two audio tones. And there are certain rules regarding how they shift that determines what that mode is. So RTTY means something very specific. PSK31 means something very specific. All right. So a little, just a little bit more on protocols. It's the rules that control the encoding, packaging, exchanging, and decoding of the di of digital data. That's how, how you use that in changing information. <laughs> Specifies how, how the packet is constructed and exchanged, and what characters are being sent. So if I want to send A, B, C, D, uh, we better be able to encode that on the transmitting side and decode it on the receiving side. And some protocols have uh, error uh, detection and correction built in. And that's all built into the protocol as well. We'll talk about some of those coming up. And the method of modulation is usually chosen, or is chosen by convention. So um, single sideband or FM is used for packet radio. So that, that's a method of modulation. Frequency shift keying or audio frequency shift keying is used for radio teletype. And this is just background in context. Ah, here we're getting into some blue text. So back to frequency shift key, we had introduced that a little earlier, switching back and forth between two tones. <coughs> two separate frequencies of a frequency shift key signal are called mark and space. There we saw that. The most common frequency spacing is 170 hertz. And we're seeing those spikes here on the, on the uh, frequency domain display. Again, space represents zero, mark one. We introduced that a little bit ago. So when we talked about frequency shift key, that's where we were directly moving an oscillator's frequency up or down. There's also another flavor called the audio frequency shift key. The question came up earlier, um, are we actually shifting the transmitter uh, frequency when we're doing direct uh, frequency shift key? And that answer was yes. But we could achieve the exact same effect if we put two different audio tones into our microphone jack and transmitted it that way. If we were going to shift an audio tone by 170 hertz fed into our microphone jack, it would sound the same on the receiving as if we were shifting the transmitter frequency itself by 170 hertz. So that's the difference between frequency shift key, where we're sending ones and zeros directly to the radio, an audio frequency shift key where we're actually sending audio tones and causing them to vary. And there are some purists among hands <laughs> that think that one is better than the other. The frequency shift keying has got some, some advantages to it, but if, if audio frequency shift keying is done correctly, it's, it, you can't tell the difference in the receive end. So FSK, okay, we saw this before. Frequency of the transmitter's VFO is controlled directly by the digital signal from the computer. And with audio frequency shifting, audio tones are used to modulate the SS, an SSD or FM transmitter through the microphone input. And most of all, what we'll be talking about is HF and uh, single side there. Of course, uh, about the HF bands, uh, we could get into more of this. So if, if we're going to connect something to the microphone input, we want to be very careful that there isn't noise there. If, if the microphone were open at the same time you were trying to apply audio tones, those, uh, the, the stuff, your cat howling or your dog barking or whatever, you, you don't want that to go out with, with your data tones. Then we're going to get into the automatic uh, level control 
and compression a little bit, but automatic level control and compression. Compression um, is used with single sideband transmission to raise the average level of, uh, of, of your speech. But um, it, it does that by distorting the audio, but the weak parts get stronger and that raises the average. We, want, we don't want that to happen with digital. The digital is very sensitive to any distortion uh, in, in level. So ALC, which we'll get into, and compression must be turned off if you're going to be using audio frequency shift key as it causes distortion to the digital data. There's something else, uh, again, this is that one in context here, called MFSK, multiple frequency shift key. Um, there's, none of these appear in the pool questions, but just gives you an idea of how much crazy variation there is within digital. MFSK 16 uses 16 separate tones. When we were talking about RTTY, it was only two tones and we were switching back and forth. Well, what if you had 16 tones? You'd have a lot more stuff to pick from, more data that you could send. Uh, and the advantage is it will stand fading into distortion a little bit better than standard frequency shift key. And here's some modes that you may have heard of, or well, Domino, EX, and Olivia. These are just other kinds of, of digital uh, formats that some humans use. MT, so we saw what MFSK16 was, MT63, MT stands for multi-tone, and it's got 64 tones. So it gets into some sophisticated software. So you, you might hear these uh, terms as, as modes of your hammer in your career. And we've been talking about um, frequency shift key. We'll talk a little bit about phase shift key now. I've got some diagrams that show uh, the differences between the two coming up. Phase shift key, generic term is PSK, phase shift key. So in this case, rather than changing tones, the phase of one tone is shifted. So if you had a continuous tone at, let's say, a thousand hertz, a thousand cycles per second, um, and while it was being sent, you flipped the phase. Normally, a sine wave is a nice, smooth 360. If you got halfway through that 360 cycle and flip the phase so that you'd, you'd have an upgoing hump, and now we're going to have another upgoing hump immediately instead of going all the way through. That would be a phase shift of 180 degrees. And I'll show you a picture of that coming up. But that's an example of how phase shift uh, works. There's two flavors that we'll talk about. Binary phase shift key and quadrature phase shift key, which we briefly, there's one cool question related to that. And these match amateur modes PSK31 and QPSK31. Phase shift key, quadrature phase shift key. And the 31 suffix indicates the approximate baud rate of baud. All right, and we'll get into some stuff that's a little more important. Okay, the 31, we're talking PSK31, it was the most popular amateur digital um, protocol out there right after it was introduced. There's a lot that have come out since then, and the new FTA protocol, the relatively new, is, is taken the world by storm. But PSK31 was the, the top dog, so to speak. That's what everybody wanted to use. It was a keyboard, the keyboard mode still is. So you could be at your keyboard saying, hi, hi Dave, is it raining in Greer today? And I could be in, uh, talking to my friend in Connecticut, saying, oh, it's, uh, it, it's not raining, it's snowing, it's terrible here. So we would be carrying on a conversation, keyboard to keyboard. So the 31 in PSK31 stands for the symbol rate, approximately, 30, approximately 31. Uh, and PSK uses a variable length code, and this is kind of a neat concept. Um, if you only have, like the letter E is the most common letter in the English alphabet, so it'd be kind of nice if we could send E with just one or two bits. And a really crazy character, like a Q or a Z, we could, we could assign more bits to that, because we're not going to use it as often, and still maintain the throughput on the channel. So PSD uses a variable length code called very code that assigns shorter codes to common characters and longer codes for others. Number of data bits varies. And have easy characters and more uh, like E's versus Z's again. 
And here's something that's interesting. They assign the lowercase letters uh, different codes from the uppercase letters. The uppercase letters use longer very code signals and thus slow down the transmission. Well, how much do they slow it down? You're probably wondering. <laughs> Well, if, if you're using lowercase letters, um, you can handle about uh, 51 words per minute between two, two people <coughs> chatting away on their keyboards. If you, if you send the same information in uppercase, you can only handle about 37 words per minute. So you usually want to stick with the, the lowercase letters. But that's the concept of very code. And the bear code, the concept of bear code has been around for a really long time. And I've got a, a chart here just to illustrate that. So here's Morse code, which I call the very code from 1844. And the way this diagram works, if you start here, it's kind of hard to see this, but it says start here. So the letter E in Morse code is E. That's a single dot. That's pretty simple. If we go a little bit further down, if, what if we want to send the letter B? Well, we paste that down here. So to send the letter B, it's going to be a dash. Um, so I'm not explaining this correctly. Well, let me do the letter O. That's easier to see. The letter O is going to be dash, dash, dash. And the letter H is going to be dot, 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 dot. So you can see that the more common letters, like T is a single dash, the more common letters get sent much faster in Morse code. That's cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah we, we've had people in our extra class who've never seen this before and just sat there with their mouth open. But I never saw this relationship. So the original very code is, uh, goes all the way back to Morse code. And another interesting factoid, um, when Samuel Morris was figuring out, well, which, which letters should I assign the least number of, of, of uh, code elements to? Well, when newspapers used to be printed with manual typesetting, they'd have what was called a type case. So they'd, they'd have a box that had just the letters E in it. So if, if you wanted to spell a word with the letter E in it, you'd take the E out of that box and, and put, it, put it in your uh, uh, type line for making that word. And the size, the relative sizes of the boxes corresponded to the, how frequently the letters were needed in the English language. So E was a big box and Z was a small box. And uh, that, that's how they actually determined that an E should be one dot and a T should be one dash. What guided the thing. A little off topic there, but the, the history, I, I just couldn't resist sharing. <laughs> Fun stuff. So when we talk about PSK 31, what that's uh, really, uh, what's really happening, that's also called binary phase shift key. So PSK then usually implies BPSK, binary phase shift key. That's just two values of phase shift, 0 and 180 degrees. I kind of described that verbally a bit ago. Amateur mode um, using BPSK is PSK 31. It runs at about 31 baud, simple rate. And here, here's the diagram that I promised you. So when we, when we have a one, which would be the mark um, symbol of the one, we can see that the, this is what's happening, the same way that the, it's coming out. Now if one we switch to zero, see how it changes right in the middle there? That's a phase re reversal of 180 degrees. So on the receive side, when it senses this phase reversal of 180 degrees, it says, oh, you just went from a, a one to a zero. And then when we flip back again, we're going to stop halfway down the sine wave and immediately go back up again, phase shift of 180 degrees. The next phase shift says, oh, uh, we, we're now moving from a zero to a one. And by uh, changing, the, changing the phase of, of, of the signal, uh, we can encode it with the digital stream of, of ones and zeros. So I, I'm hoping that that is starting to, to fall into place a, a little bit. So we, we can affect uh, the information that's being transmitted by shifting the phase of, of an audio tone. And then we'll get into the one that might make your head explode a little bit, quadrature phase shift key. So if, if we can shift a tone by 
um, 180 degrees. Uh, why couldn't we shift it by 180 and 45 and, and 270 and th things like that? So that, that's what's happening here. So we have uh, what's called an I and a Q signal, which might ring some bells from some other things we talked about in SBRs. Uh, and here's the resulting signal. So we're coming along here. Instead of getting all the way down to the zero point, um, we're at a 45 degree point and we're going to shift it. So it's possible to shift the phase uh, at points other than zero and 180 uh, and actually transmit more information that way. So that this is a real basic description of how phase shift key works uh, with more than just uh, two signal states. And it gets much heavier than that, but we won't. So. And the one question on the, on the test, Q, PSK, quadrature phase shift key 31, and PSK 31 have approximately the same bandwidth. And it can get much, much more uh, complicated than that. Because you can shift tones, you can shift phases, you can shift amplitudes. Uh, it, it, it can get really, really interesting to digital communications. But we don't have to go that far. Let's consider radio teletype now. Um, ancient history, <laughs> ancient beginnings, but still used today. This is what's called the, the Bell code, which represents or encodes each text character as a sequence of five bits. And five is going to be a real important number to remember. An initial bit, and the way that it works, it is a start bit, so that the end that's receiving is looking for what's called a start bit, so that it can start figuring out what's being sent. So there's a start bit that is sent, then five bits are sent, one to zero, and then a stop bit is going to be sent, which is just two, two bits in sequence. So an initial bit, the start bit, and the inner character pause is a stop bit, with these two bits sent together, used to synchronize the transmitting and receiving stations. And here's a picture, and I think I brought some tape. strips here, and there's holes punched in the tape that correspond to the ones and zeros that you would see in teletype. So it would be possible for a teletype printer to punch this tape and then you load it into a machine and then it would transmit that as a sequence of ones and zeros as it's, as it's pulled through the machine. And here's a picture of the tape here. And you can see that there's five bits. Remember I said five was a really important number. Five bits, um, okay, how much, how many numbers could you send with just five bits? I'm sorry? That's a lot of hanging chads. Yeah, it is, it is. It's the original hanging chad. Yeah, the original hanging chad. You're holding it in your hand. So the five bits, you can represent up to 32 numbers. Well, how, how many letters are there in the alphabet? 26, right, okay. So it wouldn't be possible to, to send uppercase and lowercase uh, letters with just five bits. So uh, we're, we're limited, we, we can't change case there, Need 26. What about the numbers? If, if it takes 26 letters to uh, form the alphabet, we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough numbers available to represent, uh, of, of, well, en enough left over to represent all of the numbers. So there's a, a code here that you can shift between letters and figures. So if you send a code that says uh, figures, then the receiving end will interpret the next uh, series of data as, as numbers. When you send the character uh, or the letters code, then it's gonna switch back and interpret everything that's coming to it as, as uh, letters. So it's, it's the way that they, um, we're able to get a lot done with uh, very old technology. And again, this goes back to like 1870. 
And we, we can see that the, the bits that are here, uh, that this little hole in the middle is a sprocket hole that uh, would pull the tape through the machine. And then whether you have a hole or not a hole, that's the ones and the zeros. So in this case, uh, we've got the chord elements one through five. So this one is going to be a zero, one, one, zero, zero. Those are the code elements for this particular letter, the letter H in this case. So Baudot uses five bits for encoding data, 32 different characters, remember five bits. Not enough for the entire English alphabet, numbers and punctuation. That's why we have the letters and figures shift, which you hear. So with, with that shift, you can get up to 62 characters. Now we can handle all the numbers and all of the letters in one piece only. Continuing on with radio teletype. On HF, the most common speeds are listed here, 60, 75, 100. Most radio conversations on HF are conducted at 45 baud. 45 baud. And the most common shift between the mark and space frequencies is 170 hertz, which we alluded to earlier. You must match your speed and shift, tone frequency shift, to communicate with the other station. Because if you're sending at a different speed or a different frequency shift, the other side won't be able to understand you. And here's a, a diagram showing how the bits actually come out. So Pado is a five-bit code, additional start and stop bits. Let's see if we can figure this one out just for the fun. So we've got mark in space tones. Mark corresponds to a one. So when and mark is normally sent continuously if, if nothing else is happening. And when we're ready to send a letter, and we're going to be sending the letter D, because that's the first letter of my name, David. Um, so here's a mark tone, and we want to send the letter D. So we're going to we're going to shift the frequency to the space tone. That is interpreted on the receiving end as a start symbol. So when, when I receive a start symbol, I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to pay attention to the next five things that are going to happen in these five time slots, so I can decode what letter is being sent to me. So, okay, so bit zero is a mark. And it goes high. Uh, bits. One and two are both spaces. So it goes low and stays low. But because on the receiving side, we're saying what's happening in this time slot, what's happening in this slot, we've just interpreted this as one, zero, zero. The next bit is going to be a one. And then the next bit, bit four, is going to be a zero. So what we've got here, the start bit tells us to start keeping track of what's coming next. And we've got one, zero, zero, one, zero. And if I haven't told you any lies, that should correspond to the letter D. Okay, Let, let's see if I just told you the truth. So let's go to D. The D is going to be one, zero, zero, one, zero. So that, that lined up. That's how we know that the D was sent. That's how it works. So that's the first character. And then two bits the same. After that fifth bit comes in, is determined as a stop bit. And then the next one can begin at the next start bit. So this can all be done in software. And today's computers will do that just fine. But this scheme of, of encoding the letters, it was current pulses in the beginning. Now, now it's audio tones in today's amateur radio uh, ready. And I've, I've got some sounds of digital, a couple of things, and then we'll take a break here. Um, and I didn't test this on our monitor. I hope it'll work. But this is what the radio teletype sounds like if it works. And it doesn't, oh, I know what I have to do. I have to turn off the laser. Okay. It's kind of a, a, a deedle deedle, they, they call it. But that's those two frequencies, 170 hertz, switching back and forth between 
பிரிச்சாராது If you're listening on the air, uh, that's that's what you would hear. All right, JT65. Some of these are rather entertaining. You kind of hear the tone wandering around. JT65, there's 65 tones that are being sequenced to send data. Sounds kind of spooky, doesn't it? Let's, let's listen to another one. PSK 31, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. Now, PSK 31 was one tone being shifted by 180 degrees. So let's see if this sounds like a single tone. You can hear one predominant tone, and then kind of a warbling as it's shifting the 180 degrees back and forth. We'll do that one again because it's short. to be short. All right, MFSK, this is my favorite one to listen to. Well, that's really crazy, isn't it? <laughs> Again. So you can tell by listening what to set up your software to decode if you're wanting to decode it on your radio. And then the one that has absolutely taken us by storm is FT8. This one goes through a little different sequence. Let's see if it's going to work for us. Yeah, here we go. Now this is eight frequencies being shifted, so you can kind of hear a more of a centralized tone, and they're not apart very far, so it doesn't sound like it's moving very much, but that, that's what FT8 sounds like. All right, and there's a, in terms of getting started with, with digital, um, the ARRL book has got uh, this, ARRL has got this book out, and it's actually the second edition. Talks, it's a beginner's guide to FT8, Whisper, which we haven't talked about, PSK31, and, and more. Not, not, a, not a bad book, you personally get this in the presentation. We'll look at the uh, practice questions, which will go much quicker than the uh, explanation did. What's the most common frequency shift for MIDI emissions in the amateur HF games? That's the tone frequency shift, B, yep, 170 hertz. Which of the following is a characteristic of Q PSK31? Which of the following describes the Bado code? Remember that number I said was so important? Yeah, five. You can find the answer with uh, five in it, and you've got it. Which of the following statements is true about PSK31? This had the magic word in it. That was the very code. The other answers aren't very sensible. What does the number 31 represent, PSP 31? That was the approximate uh, symbol code or transmitted symbol rate for bot. What type of code is used for sending characters in a PSK 31 signal? Just a different way to ask of one that we just looked at. That's our, our very quick friend again. But, Good, this would be a great time for a break, and we'll get into the next sections when we get back. All right, we're back. So now we'll get into the next section on packet-based modes and systems. 
So we were talking about character-based modes before, which you can go keyboard to keyboard between people. Our packet-based modes are like sending entire email messages from one, one location to another. We'll talk about those for a few minutes. So Pactor and Winmore are the, the two flavors that uh, have existed in ham radio for some time. Tor, the, uh, the OR stands for over radio. That's where the terminology came from. And then Pactor and Winmore can both connect with something called Winlink 2000. Winlink 2000 will take these amateur um, modes and can actually send them out over the internet. So there's a, a, a network of repeaters around the world that can interact with Pactor and Winmore. So teletype over radio, Windows messaging over radio, and you can transfer messages like email and digital files. And both use uh, some error correcting techniques and advanced modulation techniques that are much more sophisticated than we talked about for the good of character modes. And here's something that will come up. The WinLink system connects to the internet to transfer messages. So both Pactor and Winmore can connect to WinLink and transmit uh, messages around the world in this email. So packet basics. Um, here we're, where we were talking about sending one bit or just a, a few bits for individual characters. In packets, we've got what's called a header and then the data that you're sending, and then what's called a checksum. So the header is at the start of a packet, and it con controls the routing and handling information. So a packet will say, uh, I want to send this to uh, such and such a computer at, at, at such a place, and then this is the data that I want it to send, and this is how you can tell if, it, if it's correct. An error uh, correcting protocol. So packets, uh, Packets do all of these things, which is a big step beyond character-based. Now the data, and we have printed it out this way. We've got the header, we've got the data being sent, and then the trailer. The data is the information to be exchanged. The trailer, control and status information. And sometimes we dump the data so that if you detect an error, you can, you can figure out what it's supposed to be. The most common error detection is called CRC, Cyclic Redundant Check, that gets kept in here. So it calculates to see if what's it, what it's received is correct. Now there's two flavors of error correction. There's forward error correction. Forward error correction depends upon sending redundant data uh, with the packet so that if you do get some errors, you can look at that redundant data and put the original message back together. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's some fairly sophisticated uh, software algorithms for doing that, which we don't have to get into. But the key is it includes additional redundant information so that we can put it back together if it's mushed. Mushed is a technical term, by the way. I just made it up. So there's forward error correction, where we're sending information to correct errors that are in the outbound data stream. And then uh, there's forward error correction, you might wonder, well, is there reverse error correction? Well, there is sort of. That's called an automatic repeat request system, ARQ. And the way that works is that if uh, data that's in error is arrived, you ask to have it resent. That's where the automatic repeat request concept comes from. The protocol requires that a packet with errors in the data be retransmitted. So you've got forward error correction protocols and the automatic repeat request protocols. And this is an act for acknowledged or an act not acknowledged. Error detected to the sending station. And I diagrammed it this way. Um, it can be a little confusing, but I, I think this will help clarify it. So we've got a sender and a receiver. And I've got to get my laser back on again. Mm -hmm. We have a sender and a receiver. So the sender is going to send data to the receiver. And the receiver, by using the information in the packet, can tell if that packet is received correctly. OK, that's good. So if it's received it correctly, it'll send it back or an acknowledgment back to the sender. Then the sender can send the next data packet. So it's going to send data. Now the receiver, uh-oh. It didn't decode it correctly. 
the numbers didn't add up, there's something wrong with that packet. So what's it going to do? It'll, it'll ask to have it resent. That's what the NAC is. Not acknowledged automatic repeat request. So what's the sender going to do now? It's going to resend it. So data resent. And now it's okay and we've completed the process. So that's how the automatic repeat request system works. And uh, this only works up to a certain number of errors. At, at a certain point, it'll say, oh, there's just too much there. I'm not going to make this connection. And it'll drop, it'll drop the connection. And then, of course, when it's OK, it sends the acknowledgement. <clears throat> so it only works in the context of one sender and one receiver. If we think about that, it makes sense. Because if we're if we go to sender and there's lots of people listening, what if it was getting a NAC from one person and an act from another one, the poor sender wouldn't have any idea what to do. So these systems uh, only work in the context of one sender and one receiver. So how does that work over radio? Well, um, the way that it works over radio is that um, you're not allowed to make a connection unless certain uh, criteria are, are met. And, and I've got a slide that talks about that in a minute. And because it only works in the context of one sender and one receiver, it's not possible to join an existing connection. So how do you get one started, you might be wondering. Uh, there are certain frequencies that you know that the receiver is, is going to, these are mostly automated systems, you know that it's there, and the sender would send a connect request if the channel wasn't busy, and that would set up this communication between the sender and the receiver. There's also a, a method to, uh, for a system to go into what's called monitor mode to see if there's a, a conversation already going on um, that will cause it to wait until that conversation is over before it connect will be on it. <clears throat> so there's a couple of different flavors of packet modes. There's Win mode, Winmark, Windows Messaging over Radio. There's Pactor, Packet Teletype over Radio. There's three flavors, one, two, and three. And there's actually a, a, a factor of four, but it's not legal on the handbands. Two and three are proprietary protocols, uh, which means you've got to pay big bucks for the modems that work, work those modes. Uh, Pactor was extremely instrumental in the uh, Puerto Rico disaster. They were looking for hands to go out there and set up equipment in Puerto Rico so that they could send messages and email back from the island. And I think they did get temporary authority to use Backdoor 4. Okay, which is faster. Yep, that makes sense. They tend to change rules when there's emergencies going on. These are both automatic repeat request protocols and can interface to popular wind link email systems. So Winmore and Backdoor can go worldwide off the internet. Ah, okay, here's some stuff we've got to pay attention to. PACTOR, as we saw, stands for packet teletype over radio. Only two stations can connect at a time. We saw that. Joining an existing contact is not possible. PACTOR connections are limited to two stations. We diagram that. To determine if the channel is in use, that's what the monitor mode is for. Put the modem or controller in the monitoring mode. Then you know you won't be trying to connect over an existing uh, QSO that's in, in play. <clears throat> a NAC response, not acknowledged, means that the receiver is requesting that a packet be retransmitted. And the approximate bandwidth of the packet for a free signal at maximum data or, or symbol rate is approximately 2300 hertz. And again, this kind of makes sense when you think about it, because that's about the, the size of the sideband channel. Not quite three kilohertz, but it, it, it would want to take most of the sideband channel uh, to transmit a lot of data. So that might be a way that you can remember the 2300. <clears throat> Here's the Windlink system. Here's uh, all of us. These are our radios. We're talking to towers. They can be interfaced to the internet, and then they go out to these servers located around the world to trans, uh, transmit traffic. Um, Puerto Rico, we mentioned, uh, used to transfer messages via the internet. Windlink is. And Lot here, there, there's a, a web link that will work when you get this. Uh, if you're curious to know more, go there. We don't have time here. 
JT, uh, the JT modes are absolutely fascinating. I, I love these. Um, developed by uh, Joe Taylor, primarily. Include uh, FT8, JT65, JT9, and Whisper. Very effective at communicating at low signal levels. And they can, this, this is amazing, they can operate 30 dB below the noise level. So if you turn on your radio and all you hear is, is noise, there can actually be signals, uh, decodable signals under that noise with some of these protocols. How can you find it if you can't see it? You can't see it, you can't hear it, but it's there. If you've got the software that can decode it, it'll say, oh yeah, there's something going on here. Yeah, it's, it's, the software will find it and put it on your screen. It's yeah, really fun. Software magic. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Now JT65 was, was the first, uh, JT65 was the first flavor that came out probably 10 years ago, and it was designed for moon bounce. Now the, the moon is like 240,000 miles away, so amateurs who were trying to do moon bounce had to have these humongous dishes uh, and all kinds of special techniques. Well, when JT65 came out, it, it put moon bounce within the realm of common amateurs, you know, without that crazy equipment and the big dishes to be able to actually try them and bounce. In comparison, the Earth is only about 25,000 miles um, all the way around. So to get from us to Australia, or the other side of the Earth, that's only about 12,000 miles. So by, in, in comparison, the moon is a really, really long way away. And JT-65 made that possible for much simpler equipment. So what is FT8? FT8 is uh, probably 80% of the digital traffic that's uh, on the air today. It was released in June 29th, and I've got a graph coming up to show how it, how it uh, came into use. Uh, I got involved with it, I think, in July or August of 2017. It's kind of uh, in on the early, and I think I've got, last I knew in my log, I had about 5,000 contacts on FT8. They go, they go quickly and all over the world. Uh, written by Steve Frank and Joe Taylor. They uh, collaborated. Features very narrow bandwidth, only 50 hertz. You can get a lot of 50 hertz pieces into a, a sideband channel frequency. It uses eight tones. We, we heard that a little bit when I played the audio. It's uh, much, you know, JT65 took one minute transmit, one minute receive. It went back and forth. Uh, FT8 only takes 15 seconds, so it's a lot faster. It's still uh, painfully slow because <laughs> it takes about two minutes to complete that, that simple conversation or a simple QSO. And here's a diagram with the signal to noise ratio. For single sideband, this is all reference to a certain amount of bandwidth. So you said your whole communication is two minutes? Yeah, for JT60 or for JT uh, or FTA, it takes about two minutes. Just like contesting? Um, well, some people do. Yeah, FT4 has come out now for, for, for contesting. But uh, yeah, uh, CW is a lot faster for contacting than F F contesting than FTA could be. But it, it, its big advantage, FTA, is that it, it can work at extremely low levels and it's, um, when conditions are so terrible. So this comparative chart. I found fascinating. For single sideband, you need about 10 dB over noise to be able to have a, 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 a QSO conversation. CW, it can be much, much lower because we're, we're talking about 2,500 uh, hertz bandwidth that, that would be noise in there because CW is so much uh, narrower. Uh, it, it can operate a lot further down in the noise than single sideband can. FT8 can go down to minus 21. JT65 is even better, but it's slower. The JT9 was designed for HF, but it hasn't been very popular on a handband. And then Whisper, uh, which I wrote a slide on, can go as, as far down as, as 31. Its bandwidth is only like 9 hertz or 6 hertz, something like that. It's just ridiculous. But it, it's what's used on the 2200 and 630 meter bands, uh, more on that a bit. It just, uh, in, in terms of reference, 30 dB. Uh, whisper or some of these GT modes, that's the equivalent of, of a thousand times difference in power. So one watt of FT8 will go as far as a thousand watts of single side band. <laughs> Likewise, um, you can be 30 dB down below the noise with, with some of these. So that, that, that's why it's uh, really 
been wonderful in these tough times. So is there a power restriction then? You're saying like one watt. How many watts can you use? Oh, um, it's the same. Uh, FT8, uh, the power restrictions are the same as everything else on the bands. So 1,500 watts. And actually, it's, it's a weak signal mode. It's not a low power mode. Exactly. You right. can use as much power as oh, you want. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you, you could actually be transmitting 1,500 watts of FT8 if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you multiply that out by, you know, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of mind boggling. Well, in FT8 on 160 meters, you are going to have to run that kind of power. Yes, because of the noise that you're competing with. Yep, exactly. So these are just amazing numbers. And FT8 was released in June of 2017. That's here. This is from Clublog. Clublog does a, a lot of DX. Uh, um, they've got a big database for for, making, for recording contacts. So FT8 was released in June 20 in June of 2017, and by the end of the year, it was already uh, almost 60 percent of the total traffic, digital traffic, by the end of the year, and I, I was part of that. <laughs> but you can see it, everything else. It's here. Uh, it's hard to read, but CW phone, uh, RTTY, PSK. All of these other modes, uh, it, it's far surpassed them in terms of usage. And I ran these stats this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And uh, what this is, it's from a site called PSP Recorder. It also does other modes. And it says how many, um, how many QSOs have occurred or have been decoded in the last two hours as of 3 o'clock this afternoon. So FT8, over a million. These are listening stations all over the world. FT4, which is a new contesting mode, much less. CW, much, much less. GS8 is a, a, a different flavor of FT8. And PSK31, which was the rage, it was the king of data when, when it was first new, way, way down, still in use. But FT8 is just exploded. It's a lot of fun. It's a good way for a new ham to feel like they're being productive as, as you learn other aspects of the hobby. So how, how long do you think that will last before something else? Not yeah. yeah. Until somebody invents yeah. FT4. <laughs> yeah, well, FT4 is new, you know, but that's, that's less sensitive. It's more of a contesting mode. It's even faster than FT8. Yeah, what, what's, what, what are we going to have 10 years from now? Who, you know, we'll, we'll have neural implants and we'll be talking to each other with the brain waves or something. <clears throat> the math, okay. We, FT8 transmits for 15 seconds, receives for 15 seconds, and that has to go back and forth three or four times to complete the complete the QSO. Um, on, uh, uh, it, it winds up being an effective rate of about five words per minute, but it's only exchanging Maidenhead grid square signal strength and, and a call sign. So there's very little information. <clears throat> you can't use it for a, a QSO right to mode. Now there's some questions we're gonna see in the pool um, with a little bit of explanation. FT8 was designed for minimum information to qualify for a contact. Definitely not a reg to a conversation mode. So here's the, what appears in the poll. Characteristic of FT8 mode in, in this family, JT family. Typical exchanges are limited to call signs, grid locators, and signal reports. It's all embedded in, in the outbound message and decoded inbound. Operation is synchronized 15 seconds of transmit, followed by 15 seconds received, which means these events start at 0, 15, 30, and 45 seconds. And because they're starting at very precise times, the timing on both ends has to be very specific. So a requirement when using FT8, the computer time has to be accurate within approximately one second. How are they doing that now when they're dialing back WWV? Um, well, there's other time services on the internet, and there's some software that will allow your computer to connect to a time service and synchronize it within milliseconds. And I'll, I'll have some information on how to do that a little bit later if we have time for it. I've got some supplemental information at the end of the presentation. If we have time, I'll go through that and explain some of that. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get the slides for it. So there's some bonus material tonight if we get to it. We don't, that's fine. So FT8 is an audio frequency shift keying mode. Remember, we spent quite a bit of time talking about AFSK. And here's the pull cool question. Type of modulation used by FT8 is eight tone 
frequency shift key. So there's eight tones and it's bouncing back and forth be between those to carry out its messaging. And then there's one cool question that, that brings up three different um, protocols and asks uh, which one is the low signal one. So they ask about uh, MSK144, AMTOR, MX232, and the answer probably obviously is FT8. Which of the following narrow band modes can receive signals? Very low signal to noise, it's FT8. And then WISPR. WSPR stands for Weak Signal Propagation Recorder. And its purpose is to probe propagation paths by sending very weak signals from your transmitter and seeing where in the world they're received. And it's especially um, useful for the, the new bands, the 2200 meter and 630 meter bands. Uh, and since you probably haven't been on those, and may, may not be for a long time, uh, they're limited to one watt and, and five watts. It's a very low power max. Every place else we can do 1500 watts. So that the people that are into these new bands, they get excited to see where they can be heard in the world with this low power uh, emission on these, these new, uh, new bands. So whispers are very popular there. Just minimum information, transmitted power level, call sign, and you need a grid locator. And then these listening stations pour all of that into a database. So you, you can be sending whisper, and then you can go to the database and see where you're being heard in the world, which is the uh, excitement about um, those new bands. So which digital mode is used as a low power beacon for assessing HF propagation? That, that's whisper. All right. How can a pac modem or controller be used to determine if the channel is in use by other pac stations? That was the, the monitor mode. Yes. How do you join a contact between two stations using pac -4? Ain't gonna happen, you can't do it. It's not possible. It's limited to two stations. Which communication system sometimes uses the internet to transfer messages? That was Flynn then. They didn't put the other uh, packet systems up there, so that made this a really easy thing to, to, to take. <clears throat> what part of a packet radio frame contains the routing and handling information there? That is the header, right? In pack pro, what is meant by MAC? MAC means not acknowledged. Receiver is requesting that the packet be retransmitted. Sense. How does the receiving station respond to an ARQ automatic repeat request data mode packet containing errors? So, well, it, okay, it, if it contains errors, then it will request that the packet be retransmitted. So it doesn't send the same packet back, it just says, I didn't get it. And then it asks for the packet to be resent. How does forward error correction allow the receiver to correct errors by transmitting redundant data so that it can put it back together? Mm -hmm. and, all right, I, I detected an error. Do I have enough information? And what else was sent in order to correct that? <clears throat> Which of the following is a characteristic of the FT mode of this family? Use limited to call signs, grid locators, and signal reports. Yes. Very popular. Which of the following is a requirement when using an FT8 digital? Okay. Must be accurate within one second. Otherwise, uh, transmitting and receiving won't start and decode at the right time. What type of modulation is used by the FT digital mode? Yep, that was the eight tone frequency shift key. Which of the following narrowband digital modes can receive signals with a very low signal to noise ratio? Mm -hmm. yep, that was the FTA. Which digital mode is used as a low power beacon? Mm -hmm. That was our whisper frame. Yes, good. Receiving and transmitting digital modes. We're flying right along here. Make sure we're in up for time. I think we are. I don't know if we'll get to the supplemental information. Like looking at it regardless. Receiving and transmitting. Um, 
there's a whole bunch of just fact-based uh, things here that we'll leave for the poll. USD, upper side band or lower side band, is set by convention for each mode or mode of family. Now, RTTY is going to be using lower side band. Remember we talked about uh, when we're doing single side band, if it's below 9 megahertz, it'll be lower side band. If it's above, it's going to be upper side band. With the digital modes, that doesn't apply. So all RTTY is going to be using lower side band. All of these JT modes are going to be using upper side band. The things we need to know. Now, if a digital signal is not decoding, these are some of the problems that, that might cause it. You could be on the wrong side band, won't correct, won't de uh, decode. The mark and space frequencies may be reversed in some forms of software that's a setting that, that you can set, or you may have selected the wrong plot rate. So I kind of sense in all of the above coming our way here, and this is for decoding issues. Waterfall displays. Um, we, I know this came up as a question. This is a picture of an ICOM 7610, very similar to the ICOM 7300. And just like to spend a, a, a little time talking about what we're seeing here. If you haven't seen this before, it, it'll look a little intimidating. Most waterfall displays have uh, a box up here, or a spectrum display, let me call it. And the frequency is horizontal. Now notice that we're going from 14 megahertz to 14350. That's the entire 20 meter band. So this is going to be the CWM data area. This is going to be the voice area up here. So we can see the signals, it might be a little hard to see, but these little bumps are showing where in the band there's activity going on right now. So frequency is horizontal. Um, time is vertical, so we, we see a little bump, let's find a bump here. There's a, a real strong bump right here, and underneath it, this, um, this is flowing from top to bottom. So well, let's say that it's updating every half a second. So the, the current signal strength is here. Half a second later, this display is going to move down, and that signal strength will be here, and this is where the new signal strength is. So you can kind of see this flowing down the screen like a waterfall what's going on. And if you looked at this for a little while, you can actually make out CW. Now, this is the CW part of the 20 meter band. And you can kind of see dots and, and dashes, sort of, kind of, in here. This solid area here is uh, the data area, number 14070, roughly. Well, that's, that's about here. So the, the time is vertical, and, it, and it's moving down with the most uh, current data at the top. And then signal strength is intensity. So a really strong signal might be red. So this is your next door neighbor running 1,500 watts. And then there's, there's weaker ones out there as well. It's, so it's a very weak single side band going on someplace. Maybe there's a contest going on. So frequency is horizontal, time is vertical, signal strength is intensity. And any SDR will have uh, Something like this, if you go into some of the internet SDR sites, it will be a display like this. And uh, just a, a word when you're going to buy a radio, you, you want one that's got a spectrum display because they're really cool. <laughs> All right, my opinion. Uh, ALC and digital modes, uh, you said that it was very important that the signals not be distorted. And you might remember, I, I don't know if it was last week, uh, Gary said that if you key a single sideband transmitter but don't talk, how much power will be coming out of the transmitter? Zero. Zero. Exactly right. Well, uh, data works the same way. When we're sending tones on a single sideband channel, uh, if you've got nothing uh, there, there will be no power. If you've got a uh, continuous signal, you'll, you'll be getting power. And you want everything from low to high to be completely linear. Otherwise, you can get splatter and spurious emissions. Now, the automatic level control on the transmitter is it senses whether your transmitter is getting to the point of putting out too much power. If you've got a 100 watt transceiver and it senses that you're getting close to 100 watts, it will turn down the microphone input gain to lower that um, to, to get it back within range again. But of course, that changes the amplitude relationships of the incoming signal. So ALC is kind of a bad thing in digital. You want to set ALC so that it's not active at all by keeping the levels low. 
So the normal ALC will reduce transmitter level to high. Since peaks uh, may become compressed, the signals can be distorted. And digital signals are more sensitive to this kind of distortion than single sideband voice. Your ears uh, balance it out in single sideband voice. So if a transceiver's ALC system is not set properly when transmitting AFSK using SSB, sending audio tones to your single sideband transmitter, improper action of ALC distorts the signal and can cause spurious emissions. And that would be a bad thing. Because <clears throat> you might be taking up two or three times the amount of space that you need to where other people could be using the band. Overmodulation appears on a waterfall display as one or more vertical lines on the other side of the digital signal. And I've got a diagram that shows that coming up. But you need to remember the words. So here's just a little bit of knowing all of that about ALC. What, what do you do about it? What, what are actions that you can take? Well, you want to make sure that it's uh, either disabled or turned way down. Microphone input and gain should be turned down to the point where ALC does not activate. And usually on your signal strength meter, this is a combination meter where it'll be power and signal strength and compression, and ALC is one of the, the options. This is from the AC. So when you're transmitting digital, the ALC, if it's set to that, should, should not be moving at all. So you can monitor the automatic level control during transmission. Once you get a, a level set, it'll pretty much stay there. So it shouldn't be active. So here's, uh, I've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. How many have seen that movie? <laughs> All right. So this is PSK 31. This, this is good. We've, we've got a signal that's pretty well contained. Now this is bad. This is being overdriven a little bit. You can see that um, in the frequency domain, it's, it's extending to about double what it should. But it's much weaker. It's, it's not as intense here. So that, that's kind of bad. That means you probably have to level up too far. And this is the ugly. We can actually see vertical lines on either side. Um, the, and, and here's a, a link here you can learn more about it. And that the author's comment was that this, this one, and you can see stuff going all the way out here and to here. This was so bad that it couldn't even be decoded. So that this all relates back to audio levels being set correctly for digital ones. Now, transmitter duty cycle. Um, a lot of transmitters, amateur transmitters, are not designed to run full power out continuously. And some of the digital modes will transmit continuously. And it's a little bit hard to say because uh, manufacturers like to say they've got a 100 watt transceiver, but they don't like to say you can only transmit for five minutes and then you've got to cool it down for five minutes. So there's uh, what's called continuous commercial service, which means it can run at 100% continuously. And then there's uh, amateur, oh, what is it? I, um, ICAS, Intermittent Commercial Amateur Service, which is kind of a five minutes on, five minutes off kind of thing. So the, the bottom line is, if you don't know what your transmitter is capable of doing, two things you can do. One, see if it's getting hot, which means you're probably running at uh, too much full power, or consider turning the power down by about 50%. Because ready, PSK31, just about 100% can be cycle when you're transmitting. So just take the consideration. Bandwidth of digital modes. A uh, couple of things that might seem a little bit random here. The FCC, uh, of course, has specifications for bandwidth, just like they do for, for everything, for voice modes. We, we've already seen that as the symbol rate, the signal increases, so does the bandwidth required. And here's a random one here, and I think we saw it before. Bandwidth of a pack for a three signal at maximum data rate is about the size of a single sideband um, channel, about 2.3 kc. And it's the only answer that's close to that. Bandwidth of some of the digital modes, um, various ones here is the back door at 2300, FTA at 50 hertz, uh, PSK 31 at 50 hertz, Whisper at 6 hertz little tiny amount of space, which is part of the reason why it can go so low in the noise. Signal quality. We don't want to have uh, distortion and splatter. Control with audio levels. And as we said, vertical lines to each side of the main signal indicate over modulation. This one looks a little ugly. 
Now, sometimes if, if this is your spectrum display, your receiver could be overdriven. In other words, the transmitter could be perfectly clean, but if too much signal is coming into your receiver, your receiver could be causing the distortion. And you can test that by putting some attenuation in front of it. There's some attenuation control on those receivers. Practice. Which mode is used for RTTY? And extra words here you don't really need. RTY is always Both. lower side band. Okay. The JT modes, upper that's upper side band. What could be wrong if you can't decode an array or other signal, even though it's tuned in properly? Yep, that's uh, all of the above. What's likely to happen if the transceiver's automatic level control system is not set properly? Improper action of the LC distorts the signal and costs various emissions. Make sure you set it up right initially. Approximate bandwidth of the back door free. We don't want them close to 3 kilohertz. Why is it important to know the duty cycle of the mode that you're using? So you won't burn up your transmitter. Some modes have high duty cycles that could exceed the transmitter's average power rating. And, if, if you, and sometimes the manufacturers aren't very clear about how they're specking the, the power, if it's uh, uh, continuous or intermittent, but you can tell if it's getting warm. <laughs> you need to back down a little bit. <clears throat> what is the relationship between transmitted symbol rate and bandwidth? The higher the symbol rate, the uh, higher the wider the bandwidth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What is indicated on waterfall by vertical lines? Yep. Draw modulation. Which of the following describes a waterfall display? Now, this one you might have to stop and think about for a minute. So you've got all different combinations, but I, hopefully you can remember that diagram. See? Okay, frequency is horizontal. I agree. Signal strength is intensity. That's in the waterfall down below. Time is vertical. That's what's going down the display. Excellent. Okay. Digital operating procedures. This is the last section for tonight. And they kind of thrown some miscellaneous stuff in here. Anything that wasn't covered in the previous one, some of that is shown up here. So miscellaneous FCC rules for digital operating. These really sound esoteric. I, I, I italicize the words that I, I think will help you uh, answer the question. Most of us aren't going to be doing automatic control stuff uh, with, with, with packet communications. So this, to me, doesn't feel like it's going to be super useful to you. But if you get this um, on a test, you want to be able to answer it. This is from the FCC rules. When operating under automatic control, outside the automatic control band segments, those appear in the band lines, the station initiating the contact, and then this, this is the key, must be under local or remote control. So if you're operating outside the standard frequencies, Yep, the person initiating has to be under local or remote control. They have to be there while that communication is happening. Under no circumstances can you violate the FCC rules just because it's digital. That's kind of what this is saying. Under no circumstances are messages sent via digital modes exempt from Part 97 of the rules that apply to other modes. That should be an easy one to spot. And then bands where automatically controlled stations transmitting radio or data emissions may communicate with other automatically controlled uh, digital. Okay, so some, some bands this is allowed where you can have automatic operation. And the answer is anywhere, in, it says six meter or shorter, which means six meters or higher in frequency. So six meters, two meters. Um, and in limited segments of some of the HF bands. So there's, there were some automatically controlled segments in the band plan. That's, that's what this is talking about. But if you can remember anywhere in the six meter or shorter, you'll be able to get that one. So we'll, we'll see when we get to the question. Yep. Can you give me an example of an automatically controlled station? Yeah, somebody that is not, uh, the simplest explanation would be like a repeater. We're all familiar with two meter repeaters. The two meter repeater is an automatically controlled station. If, if you have an automatically controlled digital station, it's like a repeater, but it does data.
All right, Pechner and Winmore are tolerant of some interference with fading because of the error correcting things we talked about. Now, however, if communications is impaired beyond a certain limit, um, these things may happen. So if there's interference or fading, you can have frequent retries or timeouts, long pauses of message transmission, failure to establish a connection between stations. <laughs> what, what's coming to mind is my uh, speed of my cell phone when I'm at my house. Sometimes it takes a long time to get through. But in a, in a digital system like this, all of these things can happen. Um, and if they do, if, if they go on to, to excess, the connection will just be dropped. In other words, it won't hold the channel all day long trying to make contact. There are too many errors, it, it'll, it'll drop, just drop the channel. So if, if you have noise and, and interference, these can be some of the symptoms. And then if it's too much, it'll just drop the channel. All right, here's some questions. Which of the following is a way to establish contact with a digital messaging system gateway station? And I didn't actually cover this in a, it's B, transmit a connect message on the station's published frequency. So this, the standard ones have published frequencies and uh, we will try to connect there. All right, what is required to conduct communications with a digital station? Okay, this is one of those weird esoteric ones. What is required to conduct communications with a digital station operating under automatic control outside the automatic control band segments. Yes. That was the one with the control operator having to be there under local or remote control. Right. Okay. And here's another one. When can you ignore the rules under no circumstances? Digital and this works. <clears throat> On what bands may automatically control stations um, and operate, I guess, shortening it up. I will see six meter or shorter wavelength. It's just how it's configured in the rules. Okay, so look, those are, are wordy, but I, I think we've given you true tools to get to them. What symptoms may result from other signals interfering with that or, or when more? Yeah, that was the all, all of the above. What should the following is a way to establish contact with a digital messaging system gateway station? Oh, that, that's the one that, uh, yeah, we already touched that one. I just didn't convert the text yet. What, what actions from a failure to exchange information due to excessive transmission attempts, or what, what's going to happen if there's too many attempts? The connection will be dropped. All right, let's see what we're doing for time. Yeah, I think I can flip through this pretty quick. Um, supplemental information on FTA. So that, that we've been through all of the pool questions. And the, the rest of this is just to get you excited about something. All right. First of all, it's my conviction that new generals need to get on the air. So once you all get your license, you, you need to get you on the air. And this is a real fun way to do it. And we, we can do weak signal modes during the times of solar minimum we have. Making lots of contacts is fun. Um, I've got uh, I've got work all states uh, I think in a couple of months on the FTA and the DXCC that means a hundred countries work. Uh, I've got a friend uh, Alice Carver. She actually got QSL cards uh, from every state in the country and converted those uh, into uh, a, a format that she could print and cloth and actually made a quilt with the QSL cards from all fifty states in. in in the, in the union um, using the ramp radio copy that that was pretty creative making lots of contacts is fun making dx contact is exciting you can do it with fta much easier than you can on sideband you can get great results with a beginner hf station most of you aren't going to start out with a 1500 watt station and an 80 foot tower okay you're probably going to have just wider antennas and a 100 watt transceiver well you can do all of this fun stuff with a, a, a small station, which is uh, makes FTA fun. You can actually get something done. Most of the software is free, and some of the, the awards are within your reach. It's not a conversation mode. You know that. 
Okay, we already saw uh, little information on this. So is it limited by the FCC to not be a conversation? No, no, not at all. It, it's limited by the protocol. Yeah, it's by, the, by the protocol. But that's why it can go so far down in the noise, because it's sending pre-canned um, information that the software on the other end is expecting. Okay. Yep. So this, this is Joe Taylor. 15 second exchanges, 50 hertz bandwidth. And as we saw, there was uh, FTA WOW. This was as of this afternoon. And uh, we've got a couple of things going on here. This is an FT8 screen in waterfall. You all kind of know what the spectrum display looks like. This isn't showing up. Well, the waterfall is actually above the, uh, the frequencies down here. You can see where the signals are. So FT8 is in the red circles, red squares. There's another piece of software called JT Alert that tells you which states are being decoded or countries. And then there's another box over here where I put qrz.com. So the way that I've set up my system, I can see the FT8 information. I can get information on where these people are located. And I, I can get information about who I'm talking to, which makes it a lot more fun. Yeah. Is the, the second thing down on the left, is that one from the internet or is that one from the air? This, this one is here. Uh, uh, this, this, this one? one? Below the waterfall. Below the waterfall. Below the spectrum there. Yeah, that does two things. It, it's looking what's decoded on FT8, and it's going out to an internet database, and then, then populating the, this information. Yeah. And then you also get what software that'll tell you, like say you wanted a certain country, it'll notify you when it's there. Yes, yeah, JT Alert does that, which is this box right here. It has its own internal database, and when a state that you need shows up, it'll say, Wanted state. You can even have it go to your cell phone if you want. So wanted state, wanted country. Yeah. Cool stuff. Then QRZ is over, over here. So here's just a, a, a QSO in, in progress. And red means he's talking to me. And I've looked up who it was. It was this guy. He's, uh, look, looks rather, uh, this is probably what you were thinking when you started getting into, uh, an, I want to do the general. Oh my, what have I gotten myself into? That's a good book. It is. It's a great book. Ham right here for dummies. Yeah. It's FT8 in the tech bands. It's what? FT8 in the tech bands. Uh, 10 meters. There's some, some space on 10 meters where techs can operate. Yeah. But that's the only place. So well, technically, nobody here, if they have their license, has to wait to get on FT8. Right, yeah. If you got a 10 meter transceiver, you, you can actually do FT8 right now. Here's PSK Reporter. This is from a year ago, but I was uh, transmitting. These are all the places in the world that uh, my signal is being received. So these tools are available. Get started, you need a transceiver and a computer and some way to connect them. And here's the hardware pieces. You can go through it uh, item by item. This is the way all of the interconnects are, are done between them. Logging software, JT Alert, FT8 software, URZ, Logbook of the World, Club Log can all be automatically interfaced. And then there's a slide that talks about getting started. Where's the software? The time synchronization tool that you ask about. You'll get all of these links and the email that I should send you tomorrow. A little bit more on software. So do you buy the software or is it available? Most of it's free. Yeah, most of it's free. Logbook to the World is the ARRL logging uh, tool. That you can earn awards for work well states. Getting started, find an Elmer. I've, I've helped uh, probably half a dozen people get set up and started. You go ahead and do that for you too if I ever have any time, which I don't have right now. And then there's some release notes and some other, other references there. And advanced tips, again, more, more websites. So that's it. I, I hope that got you a little bit excited about some of the things that you can do uh, with, with FG8 and it as a new general. All right, we've got one minute left. So, any questions? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll take that minute to start wrapping up our stuff then. We covered a lot of stuff tonight. Thank, thanks for hanging in there with us. So, review, review, review.